Hello, uh, it's Dan Davis. I'm going to be speaking to you uh, by video this year because uh, a couple of people gave me feedback that they'd uh, rather see some of the outcomes data on video format. Um, so uh, you should be watching this before you actually come in to see us for your art training. And what I'd like to do in this session is number one, show you your data and um, show you the outcomes for the past uh, 12 months since we last saw each other. Uh, and then the second thing I'd like to do is, is introduce a couple of focus areas, uh, both for uh, your training in general and also some of the things that we'll be uh, highlighting in the face-to-face -face art training itself. Before I actually show you your data, though, I want to thank every one of you uh, for the outstanding job that you've done in this past uh, 12 months, but in the past five to six years, really. Uh, as you will hear uh, during the face-to-face, -face, there's been a lot of interest in the program uh, that it's starting to get pushed out to a regional and national level. And most of that reflects uh, the amazing job that you guys have done, particularly the code nurses. Uh, so let me go ahead and jump into the data. In this first slide, we see uh, the general trend in rapid responses and code blues. Now, uh, the code blue may not be the exact right metric uh, because we encourage folks to call a code blue when they need somebody to come quickly, but it doesn't necessarily reflect an arrest. So later on, we're going to focus on specifically the patients who lose their vital signs or have a cardiopulmonary arrest at some point. Uh, but the general trend has been downward for the code blues and upward for the rapid responses, uh, of which I'm sure you're already aware. Um, and that's the trend that we hope to see. And again, we're going to drill down on this in a second. With regard to the rapid responses, we look for a couple of important trends. The most important metric of all is the one that you see depicted on the right here, circled in red. And that's the number of non-ICU cardiopulmonary arrests normalized for the volume in the hospital, so per 1,000 discharges. And what you see is a dramatic drop with the implementation of the rapid response team from the academic year 2006-07 to the academic year 2007-08 when we first started rapid response. And each year after that, there's been a continued drop even uh, to the first portion of the current academic year, which is outstanding. There aren't too many good benchmarks, and as I've said to all of you before, the general experience with rapid response in the world has been that it really doesn't work. But the best known institutions have presented um, a rate of about three to four arrests per thousand discharges in the non-ICU areas. So it's amazing that our rates are less than one and are essentially less than a quarter uh, of what the benchmarks uh, are reported to be. Uh, so this is incredible. Uh, it's made non-ICU arrests almost a thing of the past in our institution. Uh, and this really involves everyone, the rapid response team uh, and the non-ICU nurses who are uh, more, more than willing to call for help when they need it. And I think the institution has really embraced this program as they've seen uh, the tremendous drop in mortality, uh, particularly in these non-ICU areas. Now we always look at the ICU arrests as well. We want to make sure that these non-ICU arrests aren't just getting dumped into the ICU. And so when we look at the left-hand side of the graph, we see in general there hasn't been tremendous differences in the arrest rates in the ICU. Now that being said, you see that there has been an uptick from last year to the beginning part of this year. And so that's something that we're going to drill down on in a second here. Um, but that's the kind of trend that we want to jump on. Uh, I know from, from uh, additional data, this graph here represents only the first quarter of 2011-12 and that this has come back to sort of a baseline level since then. But it's important that we follow these trends and make sure that we're not uh, just simply switching one uh, area of arrest for another. Uh, so again, keep that in mind that we've seen perhaps an increase in the number of arrests in the ICU even as we've seen a continued drop in the non-ICU arrests, and we'll try and figure out who those patients might be. If we continue to focus on the, re the rapid responses for a second, um, this is one that's important to those of you who actually perform the rapid responses, and that's how much time does it take out of your day. Uh, 
I know all of your unit managers are tracking this very carefully to make sure that the proper amount of resources being uh, allocated to the program. Um, but the two ways that we track rapid response utilization is the number of rapid responses, which you see in dark blue uh, from the onset of the program, where there are only about 25 per month in that first year, to the present day, uh, where we've seen over 50, so almost a doubling um, of the number of rapid responses per month. Now, in some sense, that's good. That reflects the traction of the program, the willingness of the non-ICU nurses and even the physicians now to start calling rapid responses. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to overwhelm the system, or again, we want to make sure that there's an adequate number of resources uh, put to the program. So we're watching that one fairly carefully. Uh, one of the encouraging things is that the um, number of rapid responses from last year to this year has stayed constant even as the rate of arrests outside the ICU has dropped and that's the trend that we'd like to see. In addition, we worked after that very first year on what we called an extrication plan, trying to figure out ways to get the rapid response nurse uh, out of there and back up to the ICU where he or she has um, their primary uh, obligation or responsibilities. Uh, and those included things like uh, using the bedside team as part of the extrication plan, saying something to the effect of, uh, let's take another set of vitals in 10 minutes and then again in 20 minutes and see what our trends are. Go ahead and call me with the results and then we'll make a, a disposition from there. Um, and so that does seem to have been effective after that initial set of training. Uh, we saw the average time per rapid response drop from an hour down to about 45 minutes, and it's stayed remarkably constant since then, that there is um, almost no variability in the, the time per rapid response. Now, one of the trends that we're watching for this year is uh, perhaps a drop in the number of very long rapid responses that are due to bed availability issues. The outliers, the rapid responses that go on for two, three, four, sometimes five hours, generally tend to be in cases where there isn't a bed available and the rapid response nurse ends up sitting with the patient until they can uh, find an adequate uh, bed. Those are, we are hoping that those actually drop uh, as we've opened more beds in the, the hospitals, particularly up at the La Jolla campus, and that perhaps bed availability may be less of an issue. Uh, so far we haven't seen a change in the incidence of rapid responses, or in the duration rather, of rapid responses. Uh, but um, it may be too early to tell since those beds are just being made available this year. Let's look at the cardiac arrests now. So we know that they're happening less frequently, particularly in the non-ICU areas. What's happened to survival? Well, this is the part that probably generates the most attention uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, because our survival rates have been so high and have been sustained even as we've eliminated a lot of uh, the quote low-hanging fruit as we've eliminated a lot of the arrests and patients in the non-ICU areas who in general would have had better survival. We've still been able to maintain survival rates in the mid-30s or, or higher. Uh, so that is remarkable. Um, it also tells us that we maybe still have uh, low-hanging fruit patients who could uh, have prevented arrests. Uh, but at the same time, I think it really speaks to the remarkable performance of the code teams in sustaining rates that are fully twice as high as the national averages. And if we add in where the national averages are from the National Registry of CPR, or what now is called the Get With The Guidelines database, you can see how much higher UCSD is compared to uh, national averages. And again, that's in the face of arrest rates that are much lower uh, than our benchmarks. Um, so are there any concerning trends here? Um, at this point, not so much, but we're going to drill down on the data and who these patients are um, to give us a better flavor of where we might um, focus our training and, and our attention. One group that I do want to highlight, and they're not typically included in our inpatient database, but that's the emergency department. They were sort of latecomers to the ART program, at least the nurses were because of county regulations and ACLS, but now that we've been able to maneuver past those, uh, the ART training has, has occurred um, for the entire emergency department, not just for the, the residents and, and uh, faculty physicians. And we've seen a couple of interesting trends that I just want to highlight, both to give them some due credit and also uh, 
uh, give you a broader perspective on cardiac arrest in general. One of them has to do with patients coming into the emergency department with what we call CPR in progress or some people call dead on arrival. Historically, and this is based on some data from myself and Dr. Gary Vilk, uh, looking at outcomes in the city of San Diego from 2000 to 2002, we had literally no survivors that came to UCSD and for almost every other hospital in the, in the city for that matter. Uh, and that includes literally thousands of patients and hundreds being transported to the emergency department uh, it, with CPR ongoing uh, that while occasionally will bring a pulse back, none of those patients were leaving the hospital alive. If we look at the middle group, uh, this picks up when our EQVR database started in 2005. And so for the two years prior to the ART program, we again saw not a single survival for, survivor for patients coming into the hospital uh, with ongoing CPR or dead on arrival. We started the ART training with our residents in 2007 and with our faculty shortly afterwards. And the nurses um, were exposed somewhere in 2008 and 2009 to the ART program. And since then we've had a survival rate upwards of 9% for patients coming into the emergency department uh, with ongoing CPR, which is higher than anyone has reported. In fact, most of the world is ready to give up on these folks and to tell the paramedics it's not worth bringing these people to the emergency department because there's nothing we have to offer. And at this point, we're trying to better understand who these folks are that we're actually successfully resuscitating and uh, try to give the medics some guidance as to who they could potentially bring to us and other hospitals in the city uh, particularly if we can get widespread ART implementation, at least here in San Diego. The other group I want to focus on when it comes to the emergency department are those who make it into the emergency department alive and then have an arrest while they're in the emergency department. Uh, we haven't really focused a lot of attention on those folks. To some degree, they've been treated like the intensive care unit in that there's always uh, critical care level personnel around uh, most of the patients are being monitored, and so when the arrests occur, in theory, it's something that could not have been prevented. Now, the first thing we did was look at the etiologies of those arrests uh, in the same manner that we've uh, taken on the inpatients, dividing them into respiratory arrests, circulatory arrests, and then primary dysrhythmias, specifically V-fib or pulseless V-tac. And you see that, amazingly, the emergency department looks almost identical to the inpatient with regard to those etiologies. A few more V-fib, V-tac arrests, a few less respiratory arrests, but for the most part follows exactly the same pattern. So that begged the question, could we implement rapid response concepts in the emergency department? Not actually dispatching the rapid response team to the emergency department, but teaching the residents and nurses about the rapid response concepts, what to look for, monitoring in the same way that we do for high-risk patients in the inpatient setting, could we actually see a decrease in the number of arrests? And then with all of the ART training, would we actually see an increase in survival? And the short answer is that yes, we've seen exactly the same patterns in the emergency department that we've seen in the inpatient setting. We've seen the rate of arrests drop to almost half of baseline, and we've seen survival, as you see here, almost double. So the emergency department has really been a microcosm of what's happened in the inpatient setting with a decrease in the number of arrests and an increase in the arrest survival rate of, for patients who do arrest, which has dramatically decreased mortality in the emergency department. This is perhaps my favorite graph, at least for this year, uh, because it tells us how things are going overall uh, and it accumulate, accumulates all of the patients who have survived who would have died based on historical data. Um, so how do you interpret this? Well, the different colors represent different groups in the hospital. The purple represent patients who uh, arrest in the non-ICU areas and are successfully resuscitated when they wouldn't have been before. The dark blue represents patients who would have arrested before based on historical data, but who are now not arresting uh, due to the work of the rapid response team. The ICU is represented in yellow and green, patients in the ICU who would have died in the past and who aren't dying now uh, are represented in yellow, uh, and then the improved survival for ICU patients is represented um, in the green. And then in the emergency department, the orange represents a, combi a combination of uh, 
uh, patients who arrive to the emergency department alive and either don't arrest as they would have in the past or arrest and are successfully resuscitated in the emergency department. And then the red represents patients arriving to the emergency department dead on arrival uh, who we've now been able to bring back almost 10% of the time. And if you look at the accumulated rates, you see that very quickly at the end of this past academic year, we're approaching 250 prevented deaths just in our institution alone. In fact, we think we've identified the 250th patient, and you'll hear more about that individual uh, in the coming months. Um, but I just want to give you some historical perspective on these numbers, which are amazing. Uh, if I reference our pre-hospital study, the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, uh, in our pre-hospital study, we're celebrating a rise in survival from 5% to about 5.7% across the entire network, which in a city the size of San Diego would mean about seven survivors a year uh, that wouldn't have survived in the past based on better training, better equipment and feedback, et cetera. Um, so seven people in the entire city of San Diego with regard to pre-hospital survival. And here in our one institution, um, we're looking at more than 50 patients a year who survive. So you can see what that would mean if we could extrapolate our programs to other hospitals in the community. Uh, if there were 20 hospitals, you're talking about literally a thousand people who might survive each year that currently aren't surviving. So the potential impact of this program is tremendous. And again, um, our nurses, particularly the code nurses, deserve uh, most of that credit. We also track a variety of process measures, and uh, this might be a little bit hard to read, but we look at things um, like uh, communication within the code, competency issues, uh, and then ultimately things like bed availability, equipment, uh, pharmacologic issues, et cetera. And so just to kind of let you know the trends that we're seeing, uh, we've seen actually a drop in crowd control being an issue, and that may uh, reflect the increasing experience of our code nurses. It may reflect the increasing experience and the change in training for our house staff that are part of the code team. And Drs. Minakade and Sell really rep, uh, deserve uh, the credit for that change in training. Uh, we've seen uh, competency issues for the code team itself drop, as you see on the very left side there. Uh, we haven't seen any particular issue with regard to um, a rise in, in issues uh, that we need to be concerned about. Again, we're watching bed availability, which hasn't been as much of an issue for Code Blues as you'll see for the rapid response teams in a second. And then we're also tracking competency issues for the non-Code uh, team members, which we didn't track before, so that's why it appears that there had been a dramatic rise in, in competency issues. That was a relatively new metric. With regard to rapid responses, again, we've seen the, the uh, drop in competency, and so that's encouraging. I think we're seeing better education overall. Uh, we've also been working fairly closely with the pharmacy on a number of issues related to medication, particularly narcotics, and so we've seen medication management drop fairly precipitously as an issue. And then with the rapid responses, there has been a drop in bed availability as a reported issue. Like I said before, this hasn't uh, manifested as a drop in the, in the number of minutes per rapid response, but again, uh, we may see this emerge as, as something that will decrease um, the total amount of time spent for rapid responses, or at least eliminate some of the very long two, three, four, five hour rapid responses going forward. It's just too early to tell. Now let's get into some of the areas that we're gonna focus on for this year. This is the grid that we're using to categorize all of our arrests. And this is a relatively novel approach. Instead of saying dead is dead and all arrests are essentially the same, uh, we've divided it not just into the shockable versus non-shockable, which is what most of the world is focused on, but in the non-shockable categories, uh, we look at respiratory arrests, we look at vagal events, which we'll talk about in a second, neurologic arrests, cardiovascular arrests, and then a small group that we uh, can't ultimately categorize due to a lack of good information. If we then take those categories and start to graph trends, uh, it becomes really meaningful. And so if we look at the incidence of arrests, you see that the most dramatic drop in arrest incidence has been in the respiratory category. 
that we've seen respiratory arrests fall to being now for the first time not the number one cause of arrests in the hospital. At the same time, when we look at causes of arrests, we see there's a couple of them that are on the uptick that we want to focus on. One of those in purple is the V-fib or pulseless V-tac arrest. This may reflect the increasing um, prominence or, or influence of the cardiovascular center. We hope that that uh, is part of what we're seeing here, that uh, more cardiac patients are coming to UCSD uh, because of the quality care available here. Uh, but when you see more cardiac patients, you're going to see more uh, primary cardiac arrests due to V-fib and V-tac. So that's a group that we're watching very carefully. Fortunately, most of these occur in monitored settings, so we're getting these folks to the right place in the hospital. Uh, and ultimately, we're going to look at their survival here in the next slide. The other groups that have been on the uptick, uh, you see that septic arrests are on the uptick, and we're going to talk about that group in a second here. Uh, and vagal events are on the uptick. Now this is kind of a strange one. Um, up until this year, these vagal events were in patients who had lines, tubes, uh, catheters in place and were being moved either to go to CAT scan or MRI or were being moved to change linens or to examine wounds. And that uh, concurrent with the uh, manipulation or movement of the patient was a drop in heart rate, sometimes all the way to asystole. This year, it's been patients sitting on the toilet, and we're not sure exactly why that suddenly has spiked up, but we've had nearly a half a dozen arrests for patients sitting on the toilet. Uh, so we're trying to figure out who those patients might be, uh, whether there's anything that could have predicted such an event, or whether there's anything that we can do differently uh, for perhaps high-risk patients um, in preventing uh, this from occurring. The last group that you see in the uptick are pulmonary emboli. They haven't been a large group uh, overall, um, and uh, we're going to follow this trend. Uh, again, this only goes through the first quarter of the year, uh, and they seem to have fallen back to a baseline level since then. Uh, but again, these are, are things that perhaps the code team can't really address, uh, but the general hospital environment needs to focus on, on uh, PE prophylaxis uh, and uh, surveillance. Now let's look at how those folks do once they have an arrest. Um, and again, we're going to have to put this together with the previous slide to really understand the impact of each of these specific types of arrests. Um, but there's a couple of important trends. The first one that I want you to focus on is the purple, kind of in the middle there. Uh, you see that uh, traditionally survival for V-fib, V-tac was relatively high, 50-60%. And then there was a precipitous drop that occurred around the time that we implemented the ART programs. And I have to admit that the V-fib, V-tac group was a group that we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about because at that time it was a relatively low percentage of inpatients uh, and we didn't anticipate that we were going to see a tremendous drop like we had. But what we did was essentially go along with what the ILCOR AHA guidelines recommended, which was that shocks occur one at a time and that they be preceded by chest compressions. Um, what we saw and what we see on this graph is that perhaps that approach isn't optimal in the inpatient setting where most of the arrests occur with patients on monitors. Uh, and we have the opportunity perhaps to emphasize not only early shock, but even stack shocks, and there was quite a bit of discussion at the AHA ILCOR guidelines meeting about whether stack shocks were appropriate for patients who had arrests while on a monitor. Now everyone agreed that that was probably the optimal approach to those patients. However, it represents a small percentage of total arrests in the world, particularly when the focus is on pre-hospital arrest, where most of the V-fib arrests don't occur on monitors. And so it was decided not to address that specifically in the guidelines. However, in the wake of our drop in survival for those patients and following that discussion at the AHA ILCOR meeting, we decided to do something different last spring. And for those of you who were part of ART uh, in 2010-11, you recall that we spent quite a bit of time focusing on how we should shock patients in V-fib or pulseless V-tac. And we went back to stack shocks. We reprogrammed our defibrillators to support that without a lot of button pushing. And it's encouraging to see that uh, the survival rates for V-fib have 
come back up to where they're now even higher than they were in historical levels. And again, given that this is only the first quarter of data, I can tell you that they've gone even higher in the second quarter. And so it appears that the optimal approach to VFib or VTAC in the inpatient setting when these generally occur on monitors is to try and uh, shock expeditiously as quickly as possible if they're not automatically shocked uh, or if they're not already attached to a defibrillator, then compressions can be performed in the few minutes while waiting for the defibrillator to arrive. But then the optimal approach appears to be not just a single shock, but to stack shocks. And what we taught was three stack shocks before reverting back to a standard approach uh, with compressions and, and uh, medication administration. So this appears to have been a successful change that we made both in the protocol and the training and we'll continue to emphasize that in the art classes. The group that you see with the most striking drop in survival has been the vagal group. And again, up until this year, these were patients being moved in the ICU. Um, but for whatever reason this year, they seem to be patients um, not in the ICU who are being uh, taken to the bathroom and literally sitting on the toilet at the time of the arrest. Um, none of those patients has survived. And so again, this is a group that we're uh, looking at more closely to try to better understand whether it's something that we can either prevent or perhaps change the approach to therapy uh, and optimize their survival. When we put both of those graphs together, the incidence of arrest and then the survival rates, this gives you a, an impression of where our, quote, low-hanging fruit, end quote, might be uh, and which groups we ought to be focused on. And so you see um, that uh, the dark blue representing the vagal group is an important group. Again, the PEs have emerged as a group that we hadn't uh, focused on much previously, but uh, there is going to be a new protocol uh, that pharmacy will oversee um, that allows for the intra-arrest administration of TPA, and perhaps in some of those patients we may be able to quickly lyse the clot and improve uh, outcome from the arrest itself. Uh, but the other group that sort of rises to the top when you look at the overall arrest-related deaths is the septic group. There was a slight increase in the incidence. They've never been a group that survives once they do have an arrest. And when you lay them next to all the other groups, you see that that now has suddenly become the number one cause of arrest-related deaths in the hospital. So let's talk a little bit about sepsis because there are going to be some important changes that involve everyone um, including the rapid response team, including the non-ICU areas, even including the emergency department. And I really have to thank Dr. Peter Fadulo for taking a leadership role uh, and his team of CERNA nurses uh, in trying to push this forward. Uh, but I'm going to try, and what I'm going to try and do now is introduce a new protocol or a new approach to septic patients that will hopefully get them taken care of uh, and decrease both the incidence of arrest um, and perhaps improve overall survival, although once a septic patient arrests, the survival is essentially zero. Um, so I want you to think about sepsis like this. It's really the combination of some infection uh, that has become severe enough to cause problems with perfusion. And it's those two pieces together uh, that define the disease, an infection and a problem with perfusion. How do we detect an infection? Well, it may be a known entity. It may be why they got admitted to the hospital, pneumonia, a urinary tract infection or pyelonephritis, a cellulitis, something that we already know about that the patient's already being treated for. It could be something that developed while they're in the hospital or perhaps uh, we didn't know exactly why they were sick, uh, but uh, suddenly something appears that tells us it's probably an infectious etiology. So fever has been the traditional metric, although a low temperature can also be an indicator of some sort of an infection. And then there might be other things in a diabetic, uh, perhaps a persistent hypoglycemia, or somebody who has altered mental status, or they're starting to complain of pain in an area that we hadn't really evaluated before that suddenly shows us there is a site of infection. What about the other side of the issue, the perfusion problem? Well, traditionally we've looked at vital signs, and they are vital for a reason. Uh, those are often our earliest and best indicators. But waiting for a drop in blood pressure uh, may be too late. 
uh, that may be a point where the cat's out already out of the bag and it's too late to really reverse this patient's course. Or the blood pressure drop may have occurred as something temporary and corrected with fluids and so we didn't really appreciate how sick this patient was. We were reluctant to call them septic uh, because that drop in blood pressure was just one single measurement and, and maybe that was just a problem with cuff placement or something else. So we want to pay more attention to uh, isolated drops in blood pressure because most of the patients who go on to die of sepsis had some indicator, even if it was just one or two blood pressure readings, that they were sicker perhaps than we thought. And then the heart rate is the other one that we tend to look at. Uh, a rising heart rate is the classic pattern. Uh, we've set some arbitrary numbers. The sepsis criteria use a heart rate of only 90 as the threshold. Um, rapid response criteria published around the world use a heart rate of 140. So there's a little bit of a problem there that one group is saying be concerned when the heart rate rises above 90. The other group is saying don't bother us until the heart rate gets all the way to 140. We chose sort of a middle ground for our rapid response criteria and we use a heart rate of 120 as an absolute measure. But probably more important than the absolute value of the heart rate is the trend and that if one patient's baseline heart rate is in the 60s and now it's risen through the 70s and 80s, that should be just as concerning as somebody whose baseline heart rate is 105 and it's now gone to 121. And so you want to look not only at the absolute value of the, the heart rate, but the trends. And that's why we've defined a change in heart rate of 15 to 20 beats per minute as being an important thing to look at and perhaps initiate a rapid response call. We also look at things like end organ function, so a rising creatinine, a decrease in urine output, maybe even just a little bit of confusion, uh, which indicates a decrease in perfusion to the brain. Um, a sense that the fingers and the hands or the toes and the feet feel cool and that that's starting to creep upward on the limbs. That's an important uh, thing to, to consider. Um, and then ultimately those should trigger a more aggressive approach to laboratory evaluation. Uh, starting to order chemistries looking for a drop in bicarbonate, an increase in anion gap, a rise in serum lactate, things that we associate with hypoperfusion. Um, so, this is how we're going to make the diagnosis of sepsis and what's happening in the emergency department and likely in the rapid response teams is that there will be standing orders for some of this workup so that we can better detect these patients early and then initiate the therapies. So let's talk about treatment of sepsis. The first thing we need to do is treat the infection. In general that means early administration of antibiotics. The earlier the better. In fact the data suggests that if you can get an antibiotic administered within an hour of initial presentation, the outcomes are going to be substantially better than if we wait two, three, four, five, or six hours. In addition, it's got to be the appropriate antibiotic. In general, in somebody who we suspect might be septic, we're going to use broad spectrum antibiotics, but even the order that they're hung is important. If, for instance, we suspect a urinary tract infection and we order Vanco and Zosin, if the vancomycin is administered first, that's unlikely to be the right antibiotic for most urinary tract infections. And given how long it takes to administer vancomycin, it may be several hours before we actually hang the zosin and even more time before that zosin is complete. And so even though we ordered the antibiotics quickly, we didn't necessarily get them infused uh, in the right order uh, quickly enough to, to derive as much benefit as possible. There may be other things we need to do to treat the infection, and a classic example would be the presence of an abscess or deep space tissue infection. Uh, we may need to remove some sort of nidus of infection in order to expect the patient to turn around and improve. The other thing that we're going to do is improve perfusion, and that can be done in several ways. That may involve administration of fluids, and one of the patterns that we're seeing in our initial analysis of the sepsis data at UCSD is that we often under resuscitate patients with fluids. We give an initial one to two liters of fluids and the blood pressure often improves somewhat, uh, but then we stop and over the next two, three, four hours there's almost no fluids administered and then six, seven, eight hours later the patient has a return to hypotension that's not quite as responsive the second time through. So we need to be aggressive with fluids and we need to make sure uh, that we continue to give fluids at least until we can establish somehow uh, 
uh, that an adequate amount of fluids has been administered, and that may involve some sort of invasive monitoring like a central line. Pressor agents are the other mainstay of therapy for sepsis, particularly when we start getting into sepsis, septic shock or severe sepsis. And there's a lot of controversy with regard to the optimal pressor agent, um, but that is one of the rationale for getting these patients into the intensive care unit where advanced personnel can start to make those decisions. The last thing we want to think about for improving perfusion is transfusing patients who might be anemic. Over the last decade or so, we've gotten into the habit of permissive anemia, allowing patients to drop hematocrits below 20%. However, in a sick patient, particularly somebody with comorbidities, they may not be able to handle that level of anemia, and they may need to be transfused more aggressively to keep the hematocrit at 30% or higher. Now let's take a look at the ARREST algorithm for 2012. Um, the first thing you see that ART is combined with PART. What is PART? Well, PART is the pediatric version of the algorithm. We haven't yet decided if we're going to issue different cards to those who only treat adults versus those who treat adults and kids. But it's an important conceptual move forward to say that all humans need to have a similar approach to resuscitation and that certain things are done only in adults, other things are done only in children. Uh, but in general, the approach is the same. And for those of us who treat children or who may treat children, but not frequently enough to stay confident and competent in pediatric resuscitation, using a similar algorithm uh, improves the likelihood that we'll be able to do an effective resuscitation. And ultimately, the treatment that's rendered is essentially identical to other algorithms like PALS. If you look on the upper part of the algorithm, we've emphasized that box that says if there's a monitored arrest in V-fib or pulseless V-tac, we're going to defibrillate as soon as possible. Now, that doesn't mean we can't start compressions if the patient's not already attached to a defibrillator, but it means that the priority becomes get the defibrillator to the bedside quickly, let everyone know that this patient needs to be defibrillated, and not only provide one single shock, but repeat at least two more times so that we have three stacked shocks. And part of your ART training this year uh, will be to refresh on how the defibrillator will help you uh, pull that off. The mainstay is still in the CPR box, or what we call CPR island. You see that our same four tasks are present, compressions, ventilations, presser, and monitor. Uh, that again, we're alternating vasopressin and epinephrine every three minutes, and pharmacy is taking a more and more aggressive role at making sure that those presser agents are administered appropriately. So you should see the pharmacist step to the front and remind you when it's time for your next dose of a presser, whether it's vasopressin or epinephrine. Uh, looking at the monitor uh, for signs of a shockable rhythm or uh, for uh, indications that the patient may have return of circulation, both of those things are the two things that would be an indication to stop compressions, um, only for the moment of the shock itself and then a return to compressions, or once you have everybody lined up and ready to go, to briefly confirm that the patient does have spontaneous circulation or returning back to compressions if that can't be confirmed. And again, you'll practice that in the art class so that you know how the monitor is going to help you with both of those decisions. Given that the filtration software is helpful but not perfect, uh, we are starting to to uh, train that you would take a confirmation or a confirmatory pause in compressions when you think you might have a shockable rhythm. We see about 20% of our shocks uh, are on non-V-fib or V-tac rhythms, and I think part of that is, is that we've uh, um, come to expect a little bit too much from the current generation of filtration uh, software. In the post-arrest care, uh, you're going to see a move towards more aggressive hypothermia in the hospital, even for patients who arrest in the hospital. Traditionally and historically, most of our hypothermia patients have been patients who had an out-of-hospital arrest or an emergency department arrest, not an inpatient arrest. And so the clear uh, trend is towards trying to cool all patients unless there's an absolute contraindication not to cool them, of which there are very few. And so expect to see more cooling of patients uh, with in-hospital arrest who remain comatose after the resuscitation. On the perfusing side of the algorithm, 
Uh, there aren't really any changes here, but one that I am going to point out that will change uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, you see again organized around the rapid response team concepts with um, circulation or perfusion deficits, ventilation deficits, dysrhythmias which are treated separately because the therapies focus on drugs and uh, use of the defibrillator or pacer, and then the neurologic uh, abnormalities over there on the right. Uh, with regard to the dysrhythmias, and specifically the tachyarrhythmias, this is where we're going to see one minor but potentially important change on the stable tachyarrhythmia side. The amiodarone that we've been talking about for several years, uh, the, the traditional formulation, uh, was dissolved in a substance that tended to drop blood pressure precipitously. So the general trend in managing a patient, particularly with VTAC, was to move towards cardioversion because it was much safer than administering a dose of amiodarone. However, the company that makes amiodarone now has a safer version called Nexterone and that we will have that drug available in the hospital uh, over the next several months. That will give us a new option for treating VTAC and perhaps even treating atrial fibrillation and some forms of SVT that aren't responding to adenosine. Um, this new formulation uh, does not appear to drop blood pressure. It's only available really as an infusion uh, and it's a fairly high volume of several hundred milliliters. So it probably won't be used initially uh, for cardiac arrest patients in a shockable rhythm. But uh, for stable patients with a tachyarrhythmia, particularly VTAC, I think we'll see more and more use of Nexterone in that specific situation. Uh, because of the cost of the drug, uh, we probably won't use it for ongoing infusions where we don't tend to see the same incidence of hypotension anyways. The rest of the algorithm looks fairly similar, similar to last year. Uh, again, in your art training, we'll practice the unstable tachyarrhythmia cardioversions, and then we'll also practice pacing, which again is fairly simple given the changes that we've made to the software. The other thing that I want to talk about that's going to be uh, introduced at some point in this next year is what we're calling the Apnea Monitoring Program, or AMP. As you may recall from the last several years, one of the biggest causes of arrest in the hospital is apnea, oftentimes as a consequence of narcotic or sedative administration, uh, but also as a consequence of patients who are perhaps overweight or just have a tendency towards sleep apnea who are coming into the hospital, perhaps going through the operating room and getting general anesthesia, or simply laying flat on their back when they may have lay on their side at home, and are suddenly set up to have apneic events. We focused on detection of those patients, either through screening in the pre-op clinic uh, for those who are going to have an operation, or simply by listening to them sleep and listening for things like snoring and snorking, uh, or brief apneic periods uh, that self-correct which all of which seem to precede uh, the potentially fatal apneic events. And in fact, the training alone has been remarkably ef effective at uh, decreasing the incidence of the apneic arrests in the hospital. Because some of the regulatory agencies are starting to catch on to this being an important disease, and because we really have led the way in many ways in trying to address this issue, uh, we formalized our program or our, our approach into what we're calling the apnea monitoring program or AMP protocol. Um, what this would do is take any patient who's either receiving parenteral narcotic or sedatives, and we're still working on the exact inclusion criteria, it may be based on the amount or it may be based on some of their risk factors, but it d divides the patient into either low risk patients who really don't have any reason to have apneic events or high-risk patients who have other comorbidities that you'll learn more about. Um, the low-risk patients could potentially be monitored anywhere in the hospital, and we would actually use the end tidal CO2 that's hooked up to a PCA pump as a way to monitor breathing. For patients with high-risk criteria, they would need to go into a higher level of monitoring, an IMU or higher, uh, where we can keep a closer eye on their vital signs, and again, monitor their breathing probably with end tidal CO2. In addition, patients noted by anesthesia to be at high risk of apneic events, patients in whom we know uh, they have sleep apnea and perhaps even have PAP therapy at home, or patients who had a rapid response related to a potential apneic event, uh, 
could also be lumped into this high risk category and monitored in an IMU or higher. If that patient is triggering lots of apnea alarms, which a lot of these folks will do, they may need to be considered for emergent PAP therapy. Some of these will already have uh, CPAP at home. Others may not have realized that they have a tendency towards sleep apnea or are receiving such high doses of narcotics or had such an effect of their general anesthetic that they're acting like they have sleep apnea and may need PAP therapy only temporarily. And we're looking at a new type of PAP ther therapy called APAP or adaptive PAP therapy uh, which adjusts the amount of pressure in order to keep the airway open. And that way, if a patient only needs this temporarily, the machine will be able to wean itself off and the patient can be discharged without uh, a CPAP machine. Uh, this protocol, you'll receive additional information as we get closer to the rollout, which we anticipate will be sometime in spring or summer of 2012. Uh, but I wanted you to see this and understand the general approach and start thinking about how that might affect uh, operations on your particular unit. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone again for the outstanding work in, in making UCSD truly a leader, not only in the country, but in the world, as far as changing outcomes uh, from inpatient arrest.